Welcome back to Public Affairs on Peach. People who obsessively play video games could soon have a formal diagnosis of addiction. That's a word from the World Health Organization. It's planning to classify gaming disorder as a mental health condition. CBS reporter Jamie Yukis has that story. As a child, you know, what, I think what really attracted me to games was that um, being born with a disability, when I played games, you know, people weren't able to judge me by the, how I looked, but rather by how I was in the game. For the last five weeks, Kevin Riley has been undergoing an intensive inpatient treatment program for his video game habit. I would definitely say it's, it was definitely an addiction for me. If we get it home from work, I'd probably put in um, at least six hours a night, sometimes upwards of 12 hours. The World Health Organization is considering formally recognizing gaming addiction as a mental health condition. The disorder, which experts say affects no more than 3% of gamers, has three main characteristics loss of control over gaming habits, prioritizing gaming over other activities, and continuing to play despite negative consequences. We definitely have seen an increase in demand. Hillary Cash co-founded Restart, one of the nation's first treatment centers for video game addiction. Phase one begins with patients like Riley completely unplugging. So they're going essentially through a detox. They also are receiving counseling and in general getting physically fit, eating healthy, catching up on sleep. But a division of the American Psychological Association says it's concerned that the current research base is not sufficient to label gaming addiction as a disorder, which may be more a product of moral panic than good science. A position supported by the video game industry. Still, advocates are hoping the World Health Organization's recognition will prompt U.S. insurance companies to cover treatment, which at Restart can cost upwards of $60,000. It's important because now it will be taken seriously as a legitimate disorder. As for Riley, he's focused on taking back control of his life. There's no really no way to avoid using technology altogether in the future, so I need to figure out a way to balance that and integrate it into my life in a healthy way. Jamie Yukis, Los Angeles. That's the key balance. Deborah Kolbrenner is a licensed psychologist who works with kids and has more information on electronic games actually rewiring brains of kids. So we thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Karen. Good information. You have some things parents can actually look for to tell if their kids are getting too much screen time and electronic addiction. Yes, I do. And they're very important things to look for. Um, one of the main things is uh, that we really want to check to see Kids tend to be more irritable, um, things that normally wouldn't be such a big deal normally becomes huge to them, so they really have a hard time regulating their emotions. Wow. Um, of course, having a parent say it's time to turn the games off can really become an enrageful sort of situation for the child. Um, they become, teachers even report that they become uh, wired and tired. Um, even the, the children themselves really see that there's something wrong with me. I don't understand why I'm feeling this way. Right. So it really is a big problem now these days. Now, I think it's interesting you say some kids are actually misdiagnosed with other things or mislabeled just because they've had too much screen time. How does that work? Exactly. Well, part of the problem with too much screen time too early is that it really impacts the development of the frontal lobe. And that's really the processing part of the brain. It's like the brain's secretary in a sense. And that controls um, attention, it controls planning, time management, organization. And when kids do start too early or when there is too much usage, then we really know that that developmental part becomes impede. And so what happens is then kids can't focus. They can't do the wow. things that teachers are wanting them to do. I think many very well-meaning parents, they give their kids some electronics a little bit too early as a way to give them the academic edge, but in turn, it's really harming them. All right, Debbie, it's too late for me, but what's too early to give your kids electronics? Well, <laughs> it really is from age one to three is really what we call the critical development. Developmental period. 
Um, right now, we really see that 30% of kids that are still in diapers are using some form wow. of electronics. Yes, I've seen it. So, um, it, it, it's a family kind of decision, but I think that the main thing is the, the longer that it's delayed. Um, definitely from one to three would be a time that to really limit. There are many great apps and things that you can do, but nothing really takes place of actually a parent rolling a ball and having the dimensional kind of interactive play that just doesn't replace what what an app can do. Now, you know, I've seen kids who have had these devices, one year, two year, two year olds, but I've also noticed speech impediments. Language that's, language, that's a very big, a very big component to it. Um, it's language, it's articulation, as well as communication skill, as well as communicating empathy to wow. other people as well. And again, that's part of that brain that really is impacting these key skills at an early age. Well, let's go over some of the guidelines, technology addiction signs folks need to look out for. So it really is being anxious, it's being able to but not regulate the emotion. It's always being able to not focus like they need to. Um, and so I think that those are some of the main things to look for. And, and of course, it's not being able to, to stop playing at the request of the parents. Now, when you say be a good role model, what do you mean by that? So I think when parents are a good role model. Kids are sponges and they're going to repeat and they're going to model what the parents are modeling. And so when we're on the phone all the time, then they know that, okay, well, this is okay. This right. is what we're going to do. So that really is one of the keys. And instead of just letting them pick the apps, you need to research some of these apps. Research it before. There are many um, apps that can really help parents know which, which apps are good and which ones aren't. But of course, making sure that you really know. Um, social media, there's really, it's, it, it's not private. No. And and so that's a big component of it. So and you've got a website that parents can use to check game apps, programs, all of those things that they're appropriate. We'll make sure to give that information out. That's wonderful. All right, Debbie, Thank thanks you. so much. Thank you so much. And still to come, we're going to talk to some educators who say the face of education is also changing. Some of it good and some of it concerning. Stay with us. We'll be right back.